So if you're new to the channel, my name is Meta Goblin, and I'm on a little adventure to explore new MMOs. Up until now, I've mainly been a classic World of Warcraft Andy. So jumping into something like Throne and Liberty has been, well, let's just say it's more of a culture shock than the average American visits in Europe, and realising that food can exist without sucralose. So here's what we're going to be covering today. Am I actually having fun, and what is the levelling experience like? Is the combat as terrible as everyone said? Just how pay to win is this game really? I think those are the questions that most people are eager to hear about. If I stick around long enough to tackle the end game grind, I'll definitely drop another video breaking down the day to day life at end game, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that video in the future. The more subscribers I get from making free content, the more I'm going to make. So, transitioning from the potato quality visuals of Classic WoW to the jaw dropping beauty of this game feels like moving from a council estate in Slough to the scenic views of the Lake District. But seriously, these graphics are next level for an MMO. It's like the game devs sat down and said, you know what, let's make every other MMO look embarrassing by comparison. And interestingly, it runs shockingly well. I've been cranking everything up to max settings, hitting a buttery smooth 80 FPS with my 4070 Ti and a 10 core CPU, even in crowded areas, and while recording or streaming. Now, unless you like setting your PC on fire, you're probably going to lower the settings for big multiplayer content. But even then, most people are comfortably running the game on medium settings with frame rates north of 150 FPS. I even know of people who are running this game on old laptops and it's buttery smooth. So interestingly, it doesn't run like the average white girl's car with zero oil changes. Uh -oh. The character creator is the first place where the visuals really shine. It's absurdly detailed. Want to change the size of your pupils? Go for it. Feel like you want the I've just dropped ecstasy or possessed by a demon look? Well, NCSoft have got you covered. There's even a recommended skin colour section, which gave me a little bit of a chuckle. You start off on a tutorial island in your own solo instance, which helps you get a feel for the game and shows what sets it apart from other MMOs. Now, the interior design of this game is a chef's kiss, melted candles, intricate clutter. They've really done a good job at making the world feel realistic. As for the leveling system, it's definitely got a good structure. This isn't one of those MMOs where you're dumped into the world with nothing but vague directions and you jump from quest hub to quest hub. You're guided through a storyline called the Adventure Codex, and while it's not 100% linear, it does branch into three different quest chains from time to time, plus the usual buffet of side quests. To be fair, I think the story actually holds up. If you want to take your time and experience it and pay attention to the story, I think you are going to be adequately interested and entertained. I think solo players will actually enjoy doing the main storyline, especially as it's free. There are also contracts in the game, which are more like repeatable daily quests, but don't worry, you don't need to grind them endlessly to hit max level, it is more of an end game thing. The main quest and the blue quest will get you to level 50 easily enough. So far, I don't really think leveling in Throne is an excruciating slog like other MMOs. In fact, when the game first launched, some players were actually getting to max level in one gaming session. That might have actually been a 24 hour gaming session, but my point is, for the average human, max level is pretty achievable in 3 to 5 days of casual playing. One cool thing is that at level 1, you get instant access to a mount in this game, because every character has a default ability to transform into a wolf, and there's absolutely no waiting around for that slow, awkward mount cast time, it is totally instant. Personally, I much prefer how mounts work in this game compared to other MMOs, it just feels way smoother and more dynamic. To be fair, travelling in Throne and Liberty isn't just functional, it's actually fun. Aside from the wolf form, you can actually use a grappling hook to scale different areas and then glide down by transforming into an eagle. It's like they've taken notes from games like Apex Legends or Just Cause, Just Cause might be a bit of a stretch, but the point is, it's really fun to get around in those games, and Throne and Liberty isn't any different. Getting from point A to B is never boring, and there are secret platforming challenges along the way for you to discover to unlock more experience. I also had a chance to dive into the group content, both in instanced and open world dungeons. I stumbled into the, gonna pronounce this wrong, the Sleus's Abyss by accident. And I loved how the game naturally led me there on some quest. I quickly found out it was group content, because 
a single mob basically handing me my backside on a silver platter. But thankfully, there was loads of other players in this area, and some guys invited me to a group. In the abyss, there were several objectives to complete for a big chunk of XP. You had to explore multiple expansive floors of a dungeon to tick all of those boxes, and sticking together as a group was crucial. These instances are huge, and if you wander off alone, you'll die faster than trying to cross the Polish border. The wolf form helps with that since it can be used indoors, making it easy to catch up with your group after respawning. Honestly, the dungeon was very fun. I could easily spend hours fighting my way through waves of enemies, diving deeper to uncover all of the new bosses and treasure chests. The only downside really was that the XP per hour from killing mobs is definitely a little low, but I guess that's to discourage people from just grinding dungeons all the way to level 50, which would get pretty boring fast. It's better to focus on completing the objective in these dungeons and then going to do something else. Now, you can also queue for instance dungeons. I tried out the Spectre's Abyss, and the dungeon design is actually pretty interesting. It's not the typical grind fest of trash mobs, boss, trash mobs, boss that you see in many other MMOs. There's more variety to the structure, which keeps things interesting. For example, all my dungeon runs, we hit a room blocked by this fiery aura, and naturally, we couldn't just stroll through. We had to explore the dungeon in order to deactivate a series of altars in order to progress. Unlike the usual MMO trash mobs, that just feel like a speed bump on your way to the boss, these mobs are a little spicier, like mini bosses most of the time. Then we finally reached the final boss, Heliber, and let me tell you, it was interesting, with challenger mechanics that kept everyone on their toes, it took a couple of attempts to finally get him down. And I did have a little moment of glory, as I was the last one standing, soloing the boss to victory. But to be honest, this experience kind of did expose a bit of a problem with the game's matchmaking system. For an Liberty, kind of sticks to the classic holy trinity of tank, DPS and healer, but the problem is I don't think anyone in our instance was an actual healer, weirdly, because I don't think the game tracks other players are actual healers very well. Basically, it was just me pulling double duty as both tank and the healer, so it was a bit of an odd one. On one hand, it's interesting that players are responsible for their own health bars to some extent, but I can see how this would frustrate players who are more used to traditional roles in MMOs, especially if you're someone who prefers the convenience of automatic matchmaking rather than pre-made groups. You might end up in situations like mine where everyone is more or less fending for themselves. That said, the game's flexibility might actually turn it into a positive. With six players per group and the ability to have two weapons and specs on the fly, you can get pretty creative with group setups. Maybe you'll run three DPS with off-spec healing and a couple more DPS with off-spec tanking to balance things out. It'll be interesting to see how group meta evolves. It's kind of like how in Overwatch where the open queue meta very often changes. I mean, sometimes it's three tanks and two healers, and other times it's a totally different mix with some DPS in there. The flexibility is there. It's not as rigid as the classic tank DPS healer formula. It's definitely very different to what I'm used to, but I can understand why people may not like it that much. Now, a lot of people are worried and mumbling about how crap the combat is, but is that true? Apparently, it feels clunky and it's not very fun, Personally, I haven't really had that experience, but I'm coming from Classic WoW, and I've only so far used the Sword and Shield and the Wand weapons. Yes, sometimes you do have to stand still to cast something, but to me, that's normal. Maybe most modern MMOs have ditched for standing and casting abilities. Maybe people are frustrated because mobs can knock you back to prevent casts from happening, and to be fair, it does seem like there's quite a lot of mobs that do that in the open world. But that probably just means that cast abilities aren't best suited for solo content, or tanking, or PvP. I imagine in PvP it will become an element of the skill ceiling working out when it is the appropriate time to use a cast ability, probably in sync and synergy with a form of CC. I don't see the problem with this really. In Classic WoW, you rarely just stand there and hard cast abilities where mobs or players are hitting you anyway. A mage, for instance, will use Frost Nova to gain distance, or a Warlock will focus more on dots in that situation. Overall, I think the criticism of a combat is a little unfair. I think it's because they have recently introduced recent changes to the combat with the Western release. It's not that bad anymore. Maybe it was just much worse on the original Korean launch. And the last topic. Is Throne in Liberty pay to win? Well, it's a bit complicated. You can't just hand over real life cash and make your character physically stronger than other players, but you can speed up your progress and reach max power faster by spending money. 
So technically it's more pay for convenience of power than straight up pay to win. I'm going to buy a sword, which other players can't get in the game naturally by playing the game, to make myself powerful. It's, it's not like that. Yes, you can call it pay to win, and that's probably quite fair. But is it game-breakingly unfair? At this point, I don't think so. But it's early days. Who knows, they may introduce future changes that make that reality a little different. Take this scenario. You could have some whale player who splurged on leveling up a specific weapon type, making themselves super strong. But a non-spending player with a ton of in-game hours could come along, pick a weapon that counters the whale player, and completely wreck them. So money won't necessarily buy you victories, it just buys you a head start. On top of that, any player can earn a premium currency themselves that's called Lucent to also benefit from the sped up progress. All they gotta do is sell items on the auction house. So while some players buy Lucent with real life money, others can get it through in-game trades. It's a bit like the World of Warcraft token system. You can buy a token with real money, sell it for gold, and use that gold to buy gear. But even then, you won't be walking around in the absolute best gear available. You'll still need to grind and upgrade it to max potential through actual gameplay. And the biggest positive of all this is the game is completely free to play. There's no subscription fee, there's no core content locked behind a paywall. You can hit max level, run dungeons, all of the end game content, all the PvP stuff, without spending a dime. So yeah, it's a little bit pay to win, but not enough to ruin the experience. The cash shop leans more towards cosmetics, which I'm totally fine with because let's be real, MMOs aren't cheap to run. The devs need an income to crank out updates and new content. And as long as it's mostly cosmetic stuff, I'm not complaining because what's more important really is a good steady flow of new content to keep players interested in the game. Don't get me wrong, I really don't like pay to win games. I don't think anyone really does, but it could be way worse. Judging by the current stats on Steam and Twitch, the game seems to be growing steadily with a healthy player base. We haven't seen a massive drop off yet, which is a good sign. Of course, MMOs are notorious for losing Steam after the honeymoon phase, so I get the pessimism from the MMO crowd. But for now, screw it. I'm having fun, and I think a lot of other players are too. And I think a lot of people watching this video, if you've not already played it, you will also. And at the end of the day, the game is totally free, so there's nothing really stopping you from giving it a spin for a couple of days to see if it clicks. Worst case, you walk away having wasted zero dollars. Best case, you find yourself a new MMO addiction. Just for the record, I'm not sponsored at all. I don't financially gain anything from the developers like a lot of other creators do on the platform and on Twitch. I'm just a dude who's genuinely enjoying the game. But obviously that reality might change when I play the endgame a little bit more, so stay tuned for that endgame review which will be coming very soon. My name is Matt Goblin, until my next video, ciao.